uh, Michael South and Grain Growers. John, I enjoyed your presentation. It was, it's always good to get a historical perspective and, and see what um, growers in different parts of the country uh, have, um, have, have worked with over, over time. And um, I appreciate also your perspective on, um, you know, on CBH and particularly from a, from a, uh, a storage perspective. Do, do growers in Western Australia have, uh, is there a mechanism or is there a um, uh, uh, process in place where they can get an independent uh, look at the performance of CBH? And I'm thinking something akin to the old Wex Weed Export Authority uh, with AWB. Is there, is there something like that where you can get that transparency into performance? Uh, process, other than um, in, internal company processes like the AGM, for example, but there's no external process that provides scrutiny on CBH. Uh, I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, uh, I, I think growers in Western Australia for a long period of time probably haven't challenged CBH enough on a number of issues, so I think that would be a good thing. But how you would bring that about, I'm, I'm not so sure. Certainly individuals and some organisations do provide uh, sporadic scrutiny of CBH. There's no doubt about that. that and they're very approachable. We've found on issues just recently, it, there's a real cultural change there. There's, there's good things occurring. So the door's always open to discuss issues. And look, if they see merit in what you're suggesting, they'll look into it further. I don't think you'd, a grower's ever dismissed anymore. So, But collectively, no, Michael, there's no, no formality. We've been, uh, I guess, as a panel, and uh, I welcome anybody in this one, uh, we, as a grains industry, have been hearing a lot of a lot of talk about the uh, the growing competition out of the Black Sea, uh, the uh, ability to produce crops uh, at lower cost, uh, the the scale of operations is going there, the amount of capital going in there is putting pressure on from a competition point of view, and uh, on our on our bulk commodities. And we've heard, I think, uh, we heard uh, from Chris. That, that you're seeing growth or opportunities in uh, small parcels where people, I assume, are asking for a different or a unique uh, level of uh, functionality. We've heard uh, uh, from uh, Tim about where customers are wanting uh, different things. We're wanting traceability, I guess, to the panel. And, it, and, and we heard from John saying that he was envious of uh, the East Coast, uh, I, I assume, domestic market pool and the lack of opportunities in poten potential that you have in Western Australia. So what is it, what is a group, what do, what do we believe are the true opp opportunities for differentiating or do we have to just fight straight on with the Black Sea on a cost, cost basis across the industry? Anyone want to have a go? Well, do you want to talk about sort of comparative advantage in, in, on, on farm and then go through the, work our way through the value chain, eh? Yeah. Um, I'll just make a comment. Um, I think that um, uh, it all can't go in containers um, and there's only a certain amount of it that's going to go in containers. That may, may be because of financial reasons as much about um, as the grades. I mean, somebody might only want a parcel of 2,000 tonnes. They don't want a whole sort of shipload. They can't afford it. Um, I, I think uh, we, we're not having to meet the Black Sea at the same prices. We've still got a, a premium, but generally um, I think it's around about twenty to thirty dollars, and then they can actually use things in the in the milling to actually compensate it. So there is a level of what we've got to compete with. So I, I, I think it's fairly serious in relation to trying to compete with it. No, if, if I can just add, I, it is unfortunate that West Australian industry doesn't have that domestic pool. So I think we are locked into. Uh, supporting CBH on their cost saving measures and just today they've sent an email to growers and they're going to move their office um, back into the, the Perth city area as a cost saving measure. So they are certainly aware of the Black Sea region and how it's making the West Australian export focus grower uncompetitive and they are trying to do it. Whether they can do that without competition, whether that external threat is enough I hope it is, because I agree with Chris, we are under pressure. 
Uh, I'm probably a bit more positive than that. I think, uh, I think we've got a fantastic opportunity to differentiate Australian product. And, you know, from our company point of view, we, we, we're putting heavy investment in quality, food safety, hygiene, uh, training people. We, we've just moved into uh, a big new state-of-the-art laboratory because what we're seeing, uh, you know, over the last year or two years, the number of customer delegations and governments that are coming into our business and wanting to understand how we ad actually manage quality and safety and, you know, five and a half million tonnes is, is a drop in the ocean fr from, from our point of view in sort of the world grain trade. It's not, sig it, you know, it, it's not a big amount and our opportunity is to actually differentiate our product from everybody else. And that's the way we're looking to compete. And quite rightly, cost efficiency is really important, but we've also got to look for where the value is as well. We heard, we heard a lot this morning. Sorry, I'll, you want to have a go, Rob? Oh, look, I was just going to say, uh, um, backing that up, is that you know, increasingly in, in vertically integrated uh, value chains, we, we take the value chain model rather than a supply chain model, it's, it's equally about the service quality as it is about the, the grade of commodity it, itself. So the, the, the way in which we differentiate ourselves is not just competing on volume and, and that discussion. We've had lots of discussions amongst ourselves even today about that, you know, the, what's the whole package that Australia offers being, you know, much more than the, the, the commodity itself. So an important part of that package, uh, we're hearing more and more uh, is going to be about, we heard it a lot this morning, is going to be about uh, food safety. And we, we're seeing uh, the food safety and branding uh, in the meat industry is really extracting a lot of value. But in a bulk commodity industry, where can we, can we use some of the other technologies that we have here uh, that we've also heard about over the last couple of days? What are they to use to, to capture greater advantage out of, uh, out of trace, traceability in, in, as it relates to food safety in the grains industry. What are the opportunities here? Well, we're probably a, a little ways away from sort of branding, but I think, uh, you know, certainly getting access to every market in the world so that we're not precluded from where the best price is on any, on any given day. Um, but I think we are in a unique position where people naturally, uh, end users actually naturally see and trust uh, Australian commodity. And you know, if you look at where the, uh, that big consumption growth is, uh, it's in China, wealth is increasing there, uh, the consumers there are wanting to have a deeper relationship with where their grain or where their commodities come from. So it's not actually being driven by uh, the end user of the grain, it might be driven by the actual consumer of uh, the, the chicken or, or pork or whatever, and wanting to go back along that supply chain. Is that you, Neil? Are you pointing at somebody over there? <laughs> Down here, please. Uh, Neil Fisher, Sugar Research Australia. Are there any other serious questions before I ask mine? Because I don't want to stifle the debate. <laughs> no other serious questions, because this is a bit out of left field. OK. Um, our family's been growing grain on the Victorian South Australia border since 1889. I repeat that, 1889. I was home at Christmas time, and I drove past the Vatera silos. And I know you have to keep costs down, but this is a question to Tim. Any chance of getting a coat of paint on the Victoria on our silo so they look like the ones in your promotional video? <laughs> I think I'm going to have to defer that one to Jane, our communications manager. She's responsible for that. Does she paint them, does she? Yeah. <laughs> look, look it, is a, it, it is a good question, the maintenance of assets. And a lot of those assets were, the, you know, the concrete assets. You, you saw the video and you saw a bit of a strip of, you know, we've got sheds, we've got... Uh, concrete, we've got steel, we've got lots of bunkers. And there's lots of value in having all those combinations, but no one's going to build a concrete silo again. And there is a balance between 
maintaining them and getting the value of those, the segregation uh, capacity, the elevation capacity, to a point where they actually t cost too much to maintain. They're not cost effective anymore. So you drop them out and you know, we've seen right over Australia, you know, a lot of small sites have actually, have actually closed. The apologies to Tim, that was a cheap shot, but I just took it anyway. Yep. A bit of self-interest there, Neil. Uh. Um, can I just make a comment uh, on that? Um, uh, our local Chamber of Commerce are trying to get a grant so they can actually paint a mural on ours, so uh, I, I hope that they're sort of successful. And, and I think they've done some uh, ones in, in South Australia and they look fantastic. We, uh, we've heard in this session a lot of, a lot of talk about deregulation. Uh, we've also, we're aware that the port access um, terms and conditions are, are up for review. Rosemary, we heard you say you thought, it, you thought it could be a lot better. Tim, you're saying you were talking about unlevel playing field, and I know you're talking about different legislation and regulation that's state-based, but what's the opportunity uh, here for port access going forward? Or is that too contentious for anyone to have a go at? You're asking me? Yeah. Oh, any of you? Um, yeah. look, look, from our point of view, I think that it's about getting the level of regulation right, but then also making sure that it's equal uh, regulation. And what we've seen uh, from a South Australian point of view is that really South Australia has been discriminated against in that uh, we're respondent to the, uh, the full requirements of the code, um, the six ports in South Australia, um, but we are competing with you know, other parts of Australia and things like long-term agreements. It took us well over a year to actually change our capacity allocation system to introduce long-term agreements. You know, I talk about the flexibility, I talk about what exporters are looking from us and what customers are looking from us uh, the ability to actually be agile and respond is really important, um, especially when other origins or other regions can, can actually sort of do that. Thanks, Steve. I'll just make a general comment about regulation in general, and, and that is about um, industry-specific regulation versus you know, broad-based competition policy-style regulation. And it's always a concern when we feel the need to have industry specific settings that require governments to know things that are really in the commercial domain. And, and whenever we do that, whenever we, we, we try and administer some sort of regulation like that, uh, it, it, becomes, it becomes fraught because the administrative system can't keep up with the commercial agility. And so part of what Tim's talking about there is that um, you know, regulatory settings that are set at one level and then the market changes, the world changes, the regulatory settings uh, no longer achieve the objective that they were, they were set up to do and, and, and need to be changed. And that, and that imposes costs both in the, in the drag on, on efficiency, but also then in the administration and the change and et cetera. And you get to the point where you're, you're in the administrative system trying to duplicate all the information that exists inside, inside industry. And so we really want to, you know, just the general principle is is, is not create systems like that that, become a, that can become a millstone, while recognising that you know, at times regulation does achieve specific, specific purposes, but it has to be done really well. Thanks, Ron. We've got, we've got one last question, and it has drawn out one from Rosemary. Thank you. Actually, no, I was going to make a comment if I could, Steve. Rosemary <laughs> just, Richards, <laughs> introduce sorry, yourself. Rosemary Richards, um, Bowman Richards and Associates. I just want to make a comment on the port access, and I think tying into the sort of, you know, if you look at you know, the innovation at John's Gone Farm and, you know, Chris, Chris and, and, you know, uh, at the independent level on, in their storage facilities and at, even at the big end and JRDC with their recent innovation call they've got. I think that with the port access, I think we just need to be careful that we don't um, go backwards. So when we had port access undertakings, we had, you know, I think something in excess of $500 million of capital tied up in in a in a in a um, premium fund, you know, like a um, auction premium fund that couldn't be utilised for investment in the industry. I know there's some talk that you know of trying to push the regulation further back up country, and I think that you know if we if we do that, we really run the risk of um, killing some of this innovation that we're really seeing. And I think the industry is just about to enter into a whole new phase of innovation with some of the investments and the whole startup movements around. And I think you know the opportunity cost of 
um, increasing the regulation um, could be quite great. So, yeah, that's my view. I, you know, that's why I was saying I think we, we run a risk that, you know, we just don't want to go back. We don't want to move the regulation any further forward and get, so, uh, you know, um, extend the regulation and get any unintended cons consequences. Great. Thanks, Rosemary. And thanks for our plug for our innovation call. Check our website. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, unless there's a burning question. I'll uh, thank everyone for their attention. Thank you for the panel for a really enlightening uh, uh, dis uh, presentations and discussions. So with that, I understand, Rowan, that uh, that's the end of the proceedings. I do believe there is afternoon tea served, so please help yourself to that. And uh, safe travel for those that are, for those that are travel travelling, and we'll see you about in, in our wonderful agricultural industry over the next 12 months. Okay.